This is WTOC. St. Patrick's Day Parade from downtown Savannah. Thanks from the Children's Hospital. Welcome to the Vidalia Onion Festival. It was a great day for the heritage. Thanks for watching. This is a WTOC original presentation. Suppose a hurricane. Let's call it Hurricane X is in this position about 1,500 miles away, threatening our coast. From that position in the life of a storm, we would be 48 hours from a decision to evacuate Greater Savannah and the Low Country as Hurricane X moves into our danger zone. Now, in 48 hours, you have some decisions to make fast. Tonight, we'll help you think through those decisions. Just 48 hours to the storm. In the low country, if you ignore a mandatory evacuation, you're going to say so long to your child. They can't make that decision for themselves. We're going to EPC your child, take it into emergency protective custody. And if you wait too long to leave, you've also lost any say in where you're going. If you wait till a mandatory evacuation, you are put in a lane and wherever that lane goes is where you go. If they're wrong this way, they have time to fix the mistake. If they're wrong this way, there's no time to fix the mistake. If you are wrong in a hurricane projection, you're dead. Exactly. Technology's better, forecasting's better, but how much better is it? And will it make a difference for you? More people were killed in the evacuation in traffic accidents than would have been killed if everybody had just stayed put. At 48 hours, it's time to shutter the windows and batten down the hatches. We'll checklist the things you have to have handy. Floating lantern right here is a great thing to have. And answer your questions about how much medicine you should take along. 60 day or 90 day prescription as we enter the hurricane season. It's 48 hours to the storm. A WTOC first alert severe weather special. This is the worst case scenario storm. Category three coming in. That means the storms are nine to 12 feet. Most of Savannah will be underwater. Prepare to leave. Pack, gasoline, get ready. Where am I going? Am I ready to go? There's no cell phone service. There's no phone service. There's no water service. There's no power service. All the things you're used to will be gone. It's 48 hours to evacuation. How good has forecasting become at pinpointing location and destruction? What does the weather and the earth do to human infrastructure? Chuck Watson is a geophysical hazard researcher and research scientist from UCF with some startling news. Because of the geography of the Georgia and Southern South Carolina coast, we could experience the second worst storm surge anywhere in the world? That is correct. We are the second worst place in the world. Uh, this is bad news. Uh, you can see, actually, that's almost the Floyd track. To prove that out, Watson goes back to the hurricanes of the late 19th century. Hurricanes that also influenced the thinking of Colonel Neil Baxley of Buford Emergency Management. That's where the town of Pacific was at in 1893 when the great storm of 93 hit. 500 people died in Pacific in 1893. Look how far that is from the ocean. Yep. Storm surge killed them. That's why we evacuate. Watson goes back to 1881 for damage estimates on a Category 3 storm that hit Hilton Head Island directly. You're putting the Hilton Head underwater. Seven meters. Oh my gosh. 25 feet of water puts Hilton Head completely under. You look at Georgetown, uh, you look at the area south, uh, south side Savannah, Oglethorpe Mall, underwater. Yeah, Windsor Forest is down Windsor under. Windsor Forest, Gotta underwater. Uh, all the way up, well up in, up the Savannah River. Uh, underwater. Because remember, that water that's coming down the Savannah River has got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if, there's, if this is blocked off by 25 feet of water at the entrance, it's going to back way up mm -hmm. for miles. So a lot of Effingham actually starts to get flooding. In now, this obviously, you said worst case scenario, the storm just a little bit further south, it would Puts, start backing up the Ogeechee River. Exactly. Down. That would put this right into the mouth of the Savannah River. If such a storm follow the same path, the financial impact is enormous. A billion and a half dollars worth of damage in Beaufort County. Alone. Largely Hilton Head, alone. Wow. Another billion plus damage in the Savannah area. Hurricane Floyd dominates storm thinking in the southeast, and it's the Floyd data that Watson uses to guide his forecasting. It's Sunday morning, two days before the evacuation. So this is basically the eye of the storm. That is the eye of the storm. In fact, if all we, the way up. we can go look at it from directly overhead, oh, wow. there's your eye. This is technology, this is capability we didn't have in 1999. So 
we would have been able to do a better job of forecasting where Floyd was going than we could have in 99. The problem is, still not quite good enough when you're talking about the fact you've got to get people out of Savannah because it mm -hmm. takes time. Is the margin of error any greater or any less? It's actually about 20% better than it was in 1999. Okay. Flip it sideways, you can start to see how this is lopsided. Mm -hmm. At this point in the storm's history, it was actually being pushed this way. So at that point, that's why the storm was moving towards us. We can move this forward to a couple days later. Look at how different that is. You notice the pattern shifted, and it's much more being It was over forward. here before. Right. Now it's now over it's, here. Exactly. If you remember, that's exactly what Floyd did. It was coming towards us. Then it got picked up by a little system that was coming down and pushed not very much, but just enough to nudge it away from us. Watson noted that the National Hurricane Center track predicted a much more threatening path for Floyd and a higher intensity. The Hurricane Center track is what they call the forecast of least regret, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. They're taking into account how long it's going to take people to evacuate and how long they have to fix the mistake if the track goes some way someplace else. Does this model also show the wobbling effect of the storm as it's uh, uh, forecast to move? Yeah, a little bit of a wobble. You're mm -hmm. starting to get into pretty bad conditions here. Mm -hmm. And we can't forecast that four days out. If it wobbles this way, mm -hmm. which is within the realm of reason, these people will not have as much time to evacuate. So if they're wrong this way, they have time to fix the mistake. If they're wrong this way, there's no time to fix the mistake. If you are wrong in a hurricane projection, you're dead. Exactly. The certainty of all hurricane patterns is compromised by the always present possibility of a wobble. Hurricane Center's role, emergency management's role, is public safety. But Watson points out that evacuation is not the no-brainer it may appear to be. We think it's about $10 million per mile of populated coast. To evacuate Chat Chatham County, just Chatham County, is probably about a hundred million dollar hit. We did a study for a tropical storm that hit Florida and more people were killed in the evacuation in traffic accidents than would have been killed if everybody had just stayed put. Nonetheless, Watson says that if an evacuation order is issued, you should follow it regardless of the improved forecasting technology. The problem is it wasn't good enough to change anybody's decision making. So even with today's models, with a situation like Floyd, if you're Clayton Scott sitting there having to decide, you've got better information, but there's still so much uncertainty in it, you're still going to have to evacuate. I have the most sophisticated computer models. I've got track information. I actually have information on tracks and data before the Hurricane Center gets it, because it's the research that I do. Mm -hmm. If they call for a local evacuation here, even if I disagree with the forecast, I'm still going to go. So Tom, 48 hours before evacuation and the biggest problem, that. Just put this beach here, put 10 feet of storm surge on the beach. The water's going way inland. Storm surge is the key. Water is the key. Tom Dunn is the emergency management coordinator for the town of Hilton Head Island. About 35, 36,000 people. Just kind of looking at the landscape right here, there is no shelter. There's nowhere exactly. to go. I mean. Correct. We're the low country for a reason, because we're low. People living on Hilton Head have several issues to tackle when a hurricane threatens. One is the evacuation nightmare of the single road, Highway 278, that connects the island to the mainland. And it's pretty obvious we have one way in and one way out off the island, so that, that creates a bottleneck. So that's the importance of people planning and preparing and leaving early. To navigate the bottleneck, emergency management has devised a plan to distribute the traffic. If you're leaving Hilton Head, uh, obviously you have one way on and one way off, so you're going 278 all the way out to, uh, to either 170, uh, you'll go to 17 or 95, okay. depending on the depending on which lane you're in. And, and I think that's an important point. If you wait till a mandatory evacuation, you are put in a lane, and wherever that lane goes is where you go. So you don't get to choose where you go. So if you leave before, you get to choose where you go. If you wait, you don't get to choose. Unlike Chatham County, which may evacuate only certain areas, all of Beaufort County will evacuate when the order is issued, and the order is mandatory. 
example, the governor says you have to leave, you have to leave. For those tempted to ride out a Category 1 thinking it's weak, Dunn cautions that the category assigned to a hurricane doesn't measure the most important thing to the low country. The category of the storm is based on wind, uh, and water is our big issue here, so storm surge. You could have a category one that has a larger storm surge in the category two. A, a great thing that the National Hurricane Center is doing brand new this year, they're calculating the storm surge. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. that is going to make a ton of difference for our beach towns. Absolutely, and that's a great tool for us. It's a great tool for us to, to be able to get the message out. Still think, you know, people are fixated on the one, two, three, four, five. So mm -hmm. one, eh, one, five, right. whoa, Katrina. But mm -hmm. once again, one category storm could bring massive flooding. Absolutely. I'm on Mitchellville Road, one of the many dirt roads on Hilton Head Island, and I decided to disobey the mandatory evacuation and stay in my home. The power goes out. I go to check the breaker. I hurt myself. I call for aid. No one's there to come because the roads are washed away. Once the winds get to a certain point, it's not safe for our crews to be on the street and, and doing emergency services. So we need to park those vehicles and get them into a safe location, which may be completely off the island. So if you choose to stay, there may be no one here to help you. One thing stressed by all emergency management officials is to have a plan. If that sounds like a time-consuming process to you, Tom Dunn says it doesn't have to be. Simply just start by, where am I going to go? Where am I going to evacuate to? And then after you've done that, then you say, okay, now how am I going to get there? So now you've, you've accomplished two very large tasks. So then you just, all you have to do is say, what do I need when I go? You've just developed an evacuation plan. Three simple steps. We've got less than 48 hours. Hurricane X is bearing down on the South Carolina coast. What's the next thing I have to do as a resident of Beaufort County? This is when you go. This is when you go and you can drive 55 mile an hour. This is when you go and you can go where you want to go. So at 48 hours, I'm hoping you've already have your plan, but what you need to be doing, you should have already considered where am I going to go. Right. You should have considered how am I going to get there. Most of us families own two cars. Am I going to take both cars mm -hmm. or am I going to sacrifice one car and leave it behind? Uh, am I taking my pets? Am I going to a shelter mm -hmm. or am I going to a hotel or a relative's place? Mm -hmm. Am I going to leave early? Now, 48 hours out of the storm, we can go anywhere we want to in South Carolina because the roads, we have not established our traffic control points yet. When we get to a mandatory evacuation, we're going to stand up traffic control points at every key intersection in the eastern half of the state thousands of law enforcement officers involved in this, and you're going to go where we want you to go. So all those mandatory traffic spots, is that what each one of these monitors is? Is that how you m right, manage John. that? Right, John. We've got a traffic management system here in Beaufort County, intelligent traffic management system that we've built out over the last decade. We've got 85 cameras, and we've got 10 highway advisory radios deployed around the county. So the law enforcement officers sitting at these desks will be watching these monitors, and they cycle through the 85 cameras, and we'll be monitoring the traffic control points that are staffed by law enforcement officers from all the various jurisdictions to make sure the traffic's flowing in the direction we want it to at something meeting a moderate Mm. speed. You know, our goal is if we can keep traffic moving at 30 mile an hour, we're going to be just tickled to death. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Neil Baxley is the Emergency Management Director for Beaufort County, which includes Hilton Head Island, Bluffton, City of Beaufort, and at the northernmost point of the county, Seabrook, South Carolina. If you look up here where it says Whitzel Road and Keens Deck Road. Where the mining camp community of Pacific used to be. And like I said, there's nothing up there now. Before an 1893 hurricane claimed 500 lives. Human life is invaluable. And that's why we evacuate. That's why we started in the 1970s with these evacuations. Prior to that, we didn't evacuate. Mm -hmm. People wrote it out. People died. The lessons of Pacific are at the top of Colonel Baxley's mind as he stresses the importance of evacuation in the event of a storm, which includes a stern warning for parents. If you have small children, they can't make that decision for themselves. I have an ESF back in the back corner that is emergency, that is emergency welfare services, mm -hmm. Department of Social Services. We're going to EPC your child, take it into emergency protective custody, and we're going to turn it over to them. And you won't see that child until after the storm and then after a 10-day period and then after a court hearing. 
because that child can't make its decision for itself. We're going to protect that child. If you're foolish enough to stay and ride the storm out, that's your choice. You do have free choice, although you're violating the law. But we're not going to arrest you for it. But we're going to take the child in protective custody, we're going to look out for them, and we're going to take your information so we can identify you afterwards. Baxley would prefer that you not wait until the mandatory evacuation where your choices are either limited or non-existent. You're waiting in traffic. We know it's going to be heavy. We only have west of I-95. We only have two-lane roads. There is not a four-lane road mm -hmm. in southern South Carolina west of I-95. So you're going to be on two-lane roads, slow traffic. Like I said, uh, like I tell everyone, if we can move you at 30 mile an hour, we're going to be tickled to death. And Colonel Baxley points out that when you decide where you're going to evacuate, make sure it's a place you'll want to be for a while. So in that 48-hour period that we're now in getting ready for Hurricane X, that 48-hour period, I already have my insurance phone numbers. I already have all that stuff done. What are the last-minute preparations? Is the car loaded? Is the car loaded? Is the car gassed? Gasoline is going to become real critical yes, and mandatory, oh, yeah. and we've, we've seen it in previous evacuations. Stations run out, and we can't get tankers in here to refill the stations because of the mandatory order. So 48 hours out, top off all your automobiles, and then limit your driving. Take all the loose stuff out in your yards, secure it so it doesn't oh, be blown yeah. around and become blowing missiles. Yeah. Think about what you're going to take out of your house and pack your car. Are you going to go to a shelter? The Red Cross sets a shelter up, and during a hurricane, you have okay. 18 square feet. There. That's not a lot of room if you're going to a public shelter. And you may be there with two or 3,000 other people. You probably don't know them. Uh, you may know one or two. But is that where you want to be, or do you want to be visiting grandkids, or do you want to be in a hotel? Because if we take a hit in Beaufort County, you may not come back for two or three weeks. We may not let you back until we can get roads you know, safely cleared, until we can get all the down power lines safely cleared. Once you're safely out of the storm's path, Buford County has a toll-free number, 1-800-963-5023. You can call to find out when you can return, or... You can go to WTOC.com and get the information there that you need streaming live. All right, Megan, we're 48 hours before evacuation. What are some of the things that we're going to need to bring with us as we evacuate to keep your family safe? Well, you're definitely going to want to have a supply of water with you, as well as a first aid kit stocked with bandages, Neosporin or antibiotic ointment and gauze pads. Um, some gloves would be a good idea as well, and some food items. Within your first aid kit, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have at least some Tylenol or a pain reliever or fever reducer in that kit to help out with aches and pains or fever related issues. What about prescriptions? Well, included in your hurricane kit, you probably want your important family documents. And that should also include your prescription medications, a list of the medications, dosages, your doctor's information and contact information should also be included. And we're 48 hours out. How quickly can people come in and get their prescriptions filled? And how much should they actually take? Should they take a week's with them, a two-week prescription? Well, we would actually recommend your first concern be getting you and your family members out safely. You can fill your prescriptions nationwide at any Walgreens, and they can take care of getting your medications that you've forgotten um, in your rush to get out. Megan Anderson is a pharmacist at the Wilmington Island Walgreens. With a one-year-old and a three-year-old, Megan has solid credentials to help families prepare for a hurricane. All right, so you have kids. What is in your evacuation kit? Lots of water and food, for sure. For my first aid, I've got a ton of princess band-aids for my children. Of course. Um, as well as antibiotic ointment and... I would throw a few treats in there <laughs> as well, just to kind of keep, keep the kids happy. Storms pass. We're coming back in. We're just what we'll call a re-entry period. It's probably going to be a lot of cleanup from the debris from the storms, a lot of trees down, a lot of power outages and stuff like that. People are going to start to be doing some cleanup. There's probably going to be a lot of uh, scrapes and scratches and stuff like that. So they're probably going to need a first aid kit. What are some of the things they would need for a first aid kit once you get back into the area? You'll probably want something to help you clean, whether that's peroxide or alcohol and fresh water. You just want to make sure the wounds are clean and kept free of debris to prevent infection. 
then if you were to see any signs of infe infection, you could follow up with your doctor. But mostly want to keep those wounds clean, and they'll probably limited fresh water at that time, so clean water is very important. Um, you know, if you ever have, you know, poison ivy or any kind of poison oak, um, it's good to take an antihistamine. Um, usually Benadryl, although it causes drowsiness, um, that can be the most effective when it's a kind of a rash. You can go ahead and also use an over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream right. or such, um, but the first thing you should do is make sure you try to get those oils off washing it. Thanks for watching the WTOC First Alert Storm Special. And again, the premise of our show tonight is to get you thinking about the things that you need to have ready in the event a hurricane threatens our area, which it will do one day. So listen to our experts. Go through the steps that you would take and preparations that you would make as we are 48 hours to the storm. 48 hours before an evacuation order is given. Where would the hurricane be? Well, I can tell you right now, it would be nowhere near the coast of southeast Georgia or southern South Carolina. It's going to be somewhere out in the Atlantic Ocean brewing and stewing over warm waters. That's a key. Temperatures in the 80s, water temperatures in the 80s, very common during the summer months across the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, all the way out to almost the coast of Africa. Further to the north, the temperatures begin to drop off in the 70s and even uh, 60s, 50s, and 40s in the far North Atlantic. That's one of the reasons why you see hurricanes moving into the North Atlantic begin to dissipate rapidly as their fuel supply is cut off. Much of the same for the Pacific Ocean, warm water temperatures. However, as you approach the coast of California, the water there is much deeper and there's a lot of mixing causing the water to cool off. Hence, the uh, temperatures in the 60s and 50s is just not warm enough to support hurricanes. That's why you don't see hurricanes affecting the California coast. But the water temperature is very important. Hurricanes form over water that is above 80 degrees. And hurricanes fuel is the warm water supply. And warmer waters produce more fuel, yielding stronger hurricanes. The uh, events also in the Pacific Ocean cause activity to develop in the Atlantic Ocean. And we have uh, odds of hurricane landfall are 66% probable during an event called La Nina, cool water off the coast of Peru in South America. Uh, during a neutral event where you don't have much of a change in water temperature in the Pacific Ocean, there's a 45% probability of hurricanes making landfall somewhere in the eastern United States. And during an El Nino event, a 27% odds. So the odds are very low during an El Nino event that a hurricane can make landfall in the eastern United States. So the question is then, what is an El Nino? And it looks like one is developing for this summer. El Nino is a warm pocket of water in the Pacific Ocean that migrates uh, toward the east, toward the west coast of, 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 of South America. And this water is warmer than normal. And in the process, it produces more thunderstorm activity in that part of the Pacific Ocean. And the outflow from those thunderstorms produce a westerly wind in the mid portions of the atmosphere. And that is called horizontal wind shear. And with horizontal wind shear in the Atlantic Ocean, hurricanes have a tough time developing during the wind shear events. Now, here's more important information. El Nino's produce Atlantic wind shear. The horizontal wind shear inhibits tropical storm development. However, during El Nino's, even though you have wind shear, you can have windows of no wind shear, and that can develop, allowing major hurricanes to form. Hurricane X will be here in less than 48 hours. So we've got Mike McGee, who's our supervisor here at Home Depot, to help us through. I got an apron, I'm ready to go. What's first? Uh, it's important that you have your disaster preparedness kit already set up. You're gonna wanna have your batteries, your flashlights, your emergency weather, hand crank radio, uh, medical supplies, your first aid kit. 
uh, a fireproof safe for your documents and important paperwork. Whoa, 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 fireproof, why, why is fireproof? It's wet I'm worried about. Well, in the event of a storm, power lines may go down, oh. there may be fires as a yep. result. Good idea, a good idea. Important well, well, what do that. I need batteries for? Pl radio plugs in the wall, no big deal there. Uh, if you lose power, you're absolutely gonna uh, need I didn't those think batteries. Of that. Okay, okay, so I got batteries, got uh, flashlights, I got the safe. What else do I need up here on the front row? Uh, How about the tools there? Uh, these tools right here are important in the event that you need to turn your power off, um, in the event that you need to uh, open up uh, access to a door perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, a floating lantern right here is a great thing to have. Uh, this right floating here is weatherproof. Floating lantern, no kidding. That way if there's flood waters and you drop it, it's gonna float back up to the top. You pick it right back <laughs> up and go. I like that thought. I, I mean, I, I hope I never have to have that thought, but thank you. You got pencils over there? Is that a pencil? A bunch uh, yeah. of pencils? That's a pencil. You, uh, if you need to mark where you're going to be hanging some plywood, uh, we oh, got some. Uh, oh, oh, here, let me some, hold it up. Yeah. I'll hold it up. All right. Okay. How much plywood do I need? You need enough plywood to cover all your windows, uh, any kind of entryways other than the main entryway for access. Uh, anything that might uh, come off during a storm, you want to make sure you have that all boarded up. How thick? Uh, that's a half inch right there, half inch ought to do the job. Okay, and how much does it have to overlap the window? You want it to overlap by at least two inches, four inches ideally. Less than 48 hours away. I need to have this stuff ready to go already, don't I? Absolutely. Is it important that you go through this whole process and get these materials together beforehand? The more organized you are, the better things are going to be for you. I also realize how America works. This is going to be a last minute deal. I'm less than 48 hours away. Are you going to have all this stuff? Absolutely. Do you have staff to help all the world get all this stuff? We certainly do. But I live in Darien, Georgia. There's no Home Depot there. Can I get this stuff at other places? Um, yes. There's probably other folks that have yeah. this kind of material, right? Right. Home Depot is a nice place to do it. Right. You're nice enough to help us do this, but you can get them anywhere, right? Yeah. Well, you come see us and we have the know-how. And the people to help you. Absolutely. And enough staff people to get you in and out when everybody else is looking for a fireproof safe and flashlights and batteries and a floating lamp, That's right? right? That's right. Gloves, flashlights, uh, respirators, hard hats. Now providing all those products is good business for Home Depot. But Supervisor Mike McGee tells me that the company is also involved in efforts to help get communities back together after a disaster strikes. Home Depot has a plan not just for the store and the stores in the area, but for the community as a whole. Uh, Home Depot is one of the first people that are going to come in there with those first responders to kind of assess the area and do what they can to assist with relief and uh, recovery. Well, one of the things that we have through Home Depot is uh, contractors that are part of a program that we have to get people in there to repair the sure. area as fast sure. as possible. Um, it's a very large network. There's a lot of company resources that are dedicated to uh, relief and recovery efforts. Mike, I see water. I see fuel down here. How much water am I going to need? You're going to want at least a week's supply of water for uh, you week? and your family. Okay, how much water per person? I would say a 24-pack of water ought to be good for uh, an individual. Uh, for an individual. And gas, that powers? Your generator. Oh, of course, which is here. Absolutely. We've got a generator that runs, and this, this can run the whole house or just a, a refrigerator, important things? Uh, this is just more for a refrigerator, some of your appliances. It's not meant for the entire home. Um, what you want to do is make sure that you're not trying to do any kind of electrical work that you're not qualified for. You don't want to try and tie into any main line or anything like that. Wait a minute, this just doesn't plug in or something like that? Um, no, it's, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's gas powered. Perhaps you if you're less than 48 hours, this is not something that's on your list. But you'd like to have this if oh. you were playing for a storm. Yeah, in the yeah. event that you weren't able to evacuate, it would be something that you'd want uh, to have ready. Okay, that's cool. All right, now let's assume everybody va evacuates. We need to be prepared for after the storm, right? That's correct. Let's look at some of those things. What have I got here? I right got there, you got some uh, some trash bags that could be used in cleanup. Uh, some bleach used to clean an area. Uh, some hand wipes just to keep yourself clean. Uh, trash bags uh, to pick up uh, debris. Uh, some safety goggles, a respirator is very important to have. Wait a minute, I got glasses on, why do I need these? Well those right there, they're going to protect your eyes in the event that you're using any kind of power tools to oh, try and clear oh, a yes. path. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I got it, I got it. And a respirator, that's good yep. stuff. I got a rake already. Well that's a very good thing to have in the event. <laughs>
especially if we've had that kind of a storm that you need to rake up, rake up debris as well. And I see down here, is this another generator down below? Yeah, that's a larger generator right there in the event okay. that you're powering more appliances, that's something that you'd want to have. Okay. So this whole table, if we look back across the table, there's a, everything that you could possibly need for a storm coming into the coastal empire, right? That's right. It's, and, and, and it's the important thing, your advice is always, plan ahead. Mike, thanks for your help today. You're welcome. <laughs> Good luck in the storm. Thank you. It's 48 hours to evacuation. How are you prepared? That's the question we asked at the Hurricane Expo this year. Well, so far we actually have an emergency closet where we have canned vegetables, canned fruits, canned meats. We have cases and cases of water. We've got, you know, your cleaning supplies, bleach, toothpaste, you know, all your hygiene that you may need. We're pretty much, much prepared. Uh, we have an escape plan. Uh, I think it was Hugo that we had to evacuate for. Uh, we went to my cousin's house in Marietta, Georgia. She had an extra room. So we've got uh, an escape plan, we've got the hurricane kits plan. I got uh, plywood to put up on the windows to, to board up the windows if need be. So we're, we're pretty much prepared. We have two or three bags of dog food ready for him to, so we can go. We have plenty of, I've got all his shot records. We've got all his medicine. We've got extra food, extra blankets, extra towels. Great a crate for him. We, he's already microchipped, which is the most important thing you can do is get him microchipped. His plan is a list of my family members, my in-laws, and uh, my, my immediate family. And uh, it's kind of a description of uh, whenever the hurricane season comes uh, for the family members to post this on the refrigerator prior to the season so that uh, in the event of a hurricane threat, um, there's the uh, evacuation plan in place. We put a plan together in terms of how to prepare an, an evacuation if it's required. We live at a pretty high elevation, so I don't expect that to be an issue. But if it is, we have everything in place, sort of the uh, standby generator if we decided to stay. If we have to go, we've got a, pan, a plan for the pets, the people, and the contacts. So I think we're ready. We stock up on water, canned foods, make sure that we have food for our dog and um, get our insurance papers, all that together. I have uh, purchased uh, about 10 gallons of water. I got all my meds together. I got flashlights. I got a chainsaw. I got a portable generator. So we always put together a disaster kit and we keep a kit with uh, water, blankets. Uh, of course we have our radio. Well, I think uh, in advance you have to have a plan. You don't want to be thinking the day before or the day of the arrival of a hurricane, what am I going to do? You really need to have some kind of outline or plan ahead of time. I think that's very important this time to go ahead and start thinking about it. All right, we watch the hurricanes into the summertime months as we uh, want to know what steers these hurricanes. Well, it's going to be this Bermuda High Pressure Center in the center areas of the Atlantic. And we like to see this Bermuda high pressure system bring a lot of the storms as they follow clockwise around the center out to the east of our area. That means we have kind of a weak area Bermuda high pressure system. Don't really like to see the neutral out there. That would bring the storms closer to our area. But if you have a little bit of a stronger Bermuda high, that brings the storms generally through the Caribbean and up into the Gulf of Mexico, well out to the south of our area. So we're going to give you kind of a worst case scenario of what we don't want to see happening for our region. Now, the best case we have is, again, is that stronger or high pressure center, which brings the storms out into the Gulf of Mexico. The worst case scenario is if we have this little trough, this upper level trough moving across the central US, that kind of makes the high pressure retreat a little bit, and that brings the center of all those winds right up here along uh, the east coast of the US. That's a worst case scenario. This is a flow of the winds which we don't want to see. If you have any type of system out there into the Atlantic, it's going to follow around the base of that high and bring it right up to the area. So a worst case scenario what we're looking at with our spaghetti plots. This is a different computer models that we look at. We don't want to see these storms tightly compacted moving right over our area. We want to see a wide range 
of possibilities of where the storm could actually go. But a worst case scenario would have a system like this moving right up into our area and it, let's, say, let's just say an official forecast track from the National Hurricane Center bring it right up through the region. Now the yellow outlines where we have tropical storm force winds. 36 hours out before tropical storm force winds move into our area, that's when a hurricane warning is going to be issued. That's when it's going to be time to move out of our area. So it's about 48 hours before landfall. That should hopefully give us enough time to prepare to get out of the region here and go to where we would have to go and just in case a worst case scenario to bring a category three hurricane, let's say moving into our area. If that track held true, what are the storm risks for our region? Well, you know, as you would expect, very high potential for rain, which would cause a lot of inland flooding, a lot of wind, especially near the center of the storm and a lot of storm surge along the coastal areas. That's going to be the main threat with any type of land falling system. So if that land falling category three hurricane moved in right just south of the Savannah area, we're looking at hurricane force winds easily even past Interstate 95. As you move in, we're all probably going to see those at least tropical storm force winds with winds of at least 39 miles per hour. And again, rainfall is another major concern, even for the inland areas away from the center of the storm. We're talking about 8 to 14 inches possibly, or even more, depending on how fast the storm actually moves through the area. And again, the greatest concern is going to be with the possibility of getting some more storm surge in here. Anywhere along and just north of where that storm makes landfall could be 17 to 23 foot storm surge flooding all of the coastal areas and even pushing on inland. We could talk about maybe an 11 to 17 foot storm surge even south of that system. So why is storm surge such a big problem? Well, on a normal area for Chatham County, let's say, Here's all the white, which is showing the land areas. Blue represents where we have the water. Category 2 hurricane, pretty much all the islands are underwater. You get into a Category 3 hurricane, pretty much all of Chatham County goes underwater. So even if your area doesn't flood, you're going to be on an island. It's time to get out whenever we have a hurricane warning and evacuation issued for our area. So hurricane planning, now is the time to prepare. Know your evacuation route. How would you get out of the area if we had to evacuate? Have your hurricane kit ready in case we have to evacuate. Evacuate and if evacuation order is issued, know what you would do. Now is the time to get out 48 hours before the storm. When you live in a world of choices, it's always nice to go and come as you please. But 48 hours before the evacuation, you may want to know your evacuation route. Now, the Hilton Head Island Emergency Management has divided Hilton Head Island into two parts. It's not split down the middle, it's by sections. And we'll take the pink first, Cross Island Parkway. If you live in any area shaded in pink, you're taking the Cross Island Parkway to get across the bridges. So if you live in Sea Pines, anything west of Leg of Mutton and Marshland Road, you're taking that to Cross Cross Island Parkway and looky here. If you live on Forest Beach, you may say, well, it's easier to take Cross Island Parkway, but your designated right is route is actually William Hilton Parkway, so it may seem like a long way around, but that's where you got to go to get off Hilton Head Island. Once you get off the island and you're taking 278, you're going to run into some folks who live north of 278, including the folks who live in Island West. Old South Rose Hill and Old South, and these are the three designated routes that you can take, but the lo low country authorities will be telling you which route to go, so it's not your choice at 48 hours. So you could take 462, 95 or 17, and they will be telling you which route to take. Now Bluffton, you're a little different. You can see anything below 278 and between 46 and 170. Your route is 46 to 170, taking 321 north. You're not taking 95, you're not taking 17, so just be aware of that. And Sun City folks, including Kalawasi folks and folks who live along Okatee Highway, just remember your evacuation route is a little different as well. Check it out. Sun City residents must leave from South Carolina Gate 170, not the 278 gate because folks will be piling out of the island on 278. So 170 is your evacuation route straight up towards 462 heading towards 95. Now in Beaufort, you're a little easier. So take a look at Port Royal, Ladies Island, St. Helena and Beaufort. I'm taking out 21 to Port Royal because you notice I don't mention the Woods Memorial Bridge. Anything over 24 mile per hour winds, they close swing bridges, 
and drawbridges, which will include the Woods Memorial. So you take the McTeer Bridge to 21 North and then head out that way. So that's your designated evacuation route. Heading into the coastal empire, Tybee, you know the drill. The only way on and off the island is US 80, but then you have some options. Islands Expressway to Bay Street, then taking 21 North, and you're going to be heading northbound if you'd like with all the Effingham folks, 21 North out of town towards Screven and Sylvania. And then if you want to take uh, US 80 to 204, you can do that as well. 204 to 95 is your option, or 204 all the way out to Bryan County. 16, very popular. They're going to make that one way, but you know it can become a parking lot. And US 80 is always an option, but that is just a two lane road, but that will become a one way westbound as well. And that is your routes 48 hours before the storm. Hurricane Arthur's brush against the eastern United States earlier this month is a reminder that the active part of the hurricane season has now begun in earnest. We're now approaching the hold your breath period for us from now through the middle of October. We're here to help you prepare and to combat the greatest threat from any hurricane. The biggest challenge I face and any emergency manager faces is complacency, is folks don't think they have to go. Clayton Scott is the director of the Chatham Emergency Management Agency. He says that during his tenure, SEMA has battled continuously to keep the public aware of the very real dangers of a hurricane, while also improving evacuation procedures dramatically. We have a great plan for medical and functional needs to evacuate. We're prepared to evacuate uh, the better part of 6,000 people to Augusta. In the event of an evacuation, Scott would assemble the leadership of the community on a conference call. The chairman of the county commission and all, all probability would be sitting in the chair to my left. Uh, uh, the county manager would be sitting in the other chair and we would have discussed ahead of time what we're going to do. I would then have a conference call initiated with the mayors and the key decision makers, the sheriff and the chief judge and the commander of Hunter Army Airfield, the Coast Guard. How about schools? Uh, Dr. Lockamy would be on the phone. Uh, these, these key players would be on the phone, and, but the decision is held by the chairman of the county commission and the mayors. And then with the concurrence of the elected leadership, he would turn to Chatham County Commission Chairman Al Scott. Mr. Chairman, we have all the mayor's concurrence. Do you agree? Uh, we have complete concurrence, and the chairman has said that we should commence the evacuation. And at that point, the WTOC weather team won't be getting a lot of sleep. Now one day, we will have a hurricane event, and we'll be here around the clock for you, 48 hours before the storm. Any presentation can be improved with video. It can give your message focus, clarity, and excitement. Let WTOC produce your video for as little as $500 and blow your next meeting away. Contact me to find out more.